Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for the introduction, Joel, and thank you for the leadership of the Institute. It's wonderful to see that we have a full room today here, and a lot of our uh, participants are students, so thank you for being here. That's really special. And I understand that the registration for the symposium was sold out long ago. You know, that really is a great reflection of the interest in education and conversation that bridges the interrelated areas of energy science and technology, business and economics, public policy, and environmental sustainability. I believe that working on these intersections is really critical for us to develop sustainable solution to complex societal problems, including clean energy and environmental sustainability. And it's really encouraging to see so many people interested in becoming engaged with them. And I'm really pleased that the Institute for Energy Studies is leading the way for education and public discourse with this symposium. I also know that this is a team sport and that events like these and the Institute itself are the culmination of efforts that many people have contributed to for a long time. So I'd like to thank the faculty and staff who work with the Institute, the Institute's advisory board, and I know there are several members that are here today with us, which provides powerful guidance and advocacy for the Institute, and everyone else who contributed to making the symposium today possible. Finally, I'd like to thank, out our, panel, thank our panelists for taking the time off your busy schedules to be, uh, to be with us today to share your experiences, insights, and expertise. It is now my pleasure and an honor to introduce our special guest for this morning, Governor Jay Inslee. And I would also like to welcome Governor Trudy, who is with us today. Uh, Trudy Inslee, thank you so much for joining us. Governor Inslee is a fifth-generation Washingtonian with distinguished record of public service in the state of Washington, having served in both the state and the U.S. House of Representatives, and of course now in his second term as Washington's governor. I think it's important that, that Governor Inslee first became involved in public service in 1985 when he and Trudy help lead the effort to build a new public high school in Saleh. As governor, he has been a staunch advocate for education at all levels and has championed investments in higher education in particular, including reducing tuition for all in-state college students and increasing financial aid. And as many of you know, the tu tuition reduction in the 1517 biennium in Washington was really the first in the nation tuition reduction for all college students, so we really appreciate that support. He has been a champion for environmental conservation and an advocate for taking action on climate change and developing of clean energy and sustainable transportation. Now, some of you I'm sure know, but perhaps some of you may not know that Governor Inslee is also an author of a book entitled Apollo's Fire which makes the case for a vision of clean energy, battling the vision of the Apollo project that promised to put a man on the moon within a decade. His remarks today, repowering mobility, envisioning a new future for transportation energy, will focus on the complex interrelated issues in energy science and technology, public policy and sustainable economic development just the kinds of interdisciplinary issues that the Institute for Energy Studies strive to prepare Western students. And I know that the students in the audience are particularly eager to learn. So please join me in welcoming Governor Jay Inslee. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It is so inspiring to have at least one, one president who believes in clean energy. So we really appreciate your leadership 
Thank you. I just, I just love here being here this morning. Trudy and I are so excited to be here for three reasons. First off, uh, when I tell my eight-year-old grandson that I spoke in the Harry Potter room, my stock's going to go way up as a grandfather, okay? That's number one. Number two, to be here, this is meaning, so meaningful to be on this campus. Uh, my brother got to play football and was a now retired teacher, learned to teach here in the 70s. My son Joe from Grace Wrong. Where's Grace? Is Grace here? Where's? Grace. Grace, can we give a round of applause for a woman who taught so much to my son who's now doing great work for Noah? Grace, thank you for your work. The third reason, uh, which is more relevant, is that uh, this morning is the, for me personally, is perhaps the alpha and omega of the story of energy in, in this uh, century. Uh, I get both sides of our vision statement this morning, both the alpha and the omega. I'll start with the bad news to start with that because that'll be shorter. This morning I open up the newspaper. I still read newspapers. I'm sorry. I'm still hooked on reading actual newsprint. And I read about a river, I believe it's in Alaska, that because a glacier is melting rapidly and receding due to climate change, a river that used to run into the Arctic Ocean actually has been stolen by a river and now runs into the Pacific Ocean. In a geologic blink of an eye, a whole river system which used to run into one ocean is now running into a different ocean. We've always thought of geology as moving at a glacial pace. Geology doesn't move at a glacial pace anymore. It moves at lightning speed because we're changing climate systems so rapidly that we are actually changing geological systems because of the rapidity of climate change. Think about that for a second. What we used to think about was this slow moving kind of thing that we would through this gradual accretion of different changes of you know small little tenths of a second. No, these things can, can change things literally in a geological blink of an eye. That would suggest, that would suggest that we should develop a clean energy future for the planet. Now that's the alpha. The omega here is that uh, at least today I'll declare the single most exciting place in the most exciting state in the most exciting country in the world which is at the Energy Institute at Western Washington University today. That's what I'm declaring this is the most exciting. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, decades ago there were the vast majority of people did not see the potential electrification, for instance, of our transportation fleet is a realistic possibility. But here at Bellingham, Washington, you had Professor Eric uh, Lenhart and a group of multiple generations of students who had this vision statement of the electrification of our transportation system. And at the time, that was seen as a far out effort which is kind of interesting actually because I saw a, a photograph at our historical museum two weeks ago in Tacoma of the very first car in Seattle, Washington. Very first car, it's now sitting in our museum. Guess what kind of car that is? It's an electric car. So Western Washington understood the, the history and the vision of the electric vehicle. And for decades now, Western students have been perfecting and creating new vision statements of how to electrify the car. Uh, Go back seven years, I had this vision that perhaps we could really make this happen. So I wrote a little book called Apollo's Fire. It was about how we were going to ignite the clean energy economy. I wrote a book about, in my book, I wrote about a little company called Tesla. Uh, you know, this guy on Elon Musk had this crazy idea that we could electrify the car. I thought that that actually had some possibility. Well, two weeks ago, we found out that Tesla has a greater capital worth than Ford and General Motors and is now sweeping the country. We know we can make this happen. And we know because Western is making it happen. And I want to talk to you about the things of how we want to help Western make this happen. The first I want to tell you that I'm going to tell the story of Western when I go back to Olympia. Because we need legislators to be half as creative and half as innovative and half as optimistic as the students right here. Let me give you a reason why I think they ought to be optimistic. I walk into the lobby 
and I meet a young woman named Amy who explains to me this new way of, t of, of concentrating and, and, uh, and transporting solar waves using quantum dots to then transport waves to a photoelectric cell on the, on the periphery of a, of a glazing surface. So instead of wasting energy that turns into waste heat that you have to manage, you can now you use your windows actually as a photoelectric cell. Now how's about that as a vision statement that's happening right here in Western? Can we just give this great team, Amy and your team, I want to give you a round of applause. Where are you? Amy, where's your team? Where's Amy and your team? That's the kind of thing that lifts uh, spirits and sh should lift legislators' eyes to the horizon about what's possible in clean energy. So I want to talk about some things that we want to help you right here in Western. Number one, we want to help students come here and get this incredible chemistry and energy both in policy and physics and mathematics. So the first thing I want legislators to do is to increase by 14,000 the number of need grants that kids can get so they can afford to go to Western Washington University. Now, isn't that a great idea to get 14,000 more students to have need grants? I want to make that happen this year in the legislature. Second, I want to continue our multiple efforts to electrify our transportation system. That starts by our increasing expansion of electric charging stations to make this an easier uh, transformation. That, that comes from extending uh, our sales tax um, exclusion uh, to extend it to mid-range mid models so we can have an increasing break for people as a small incentive to expedite this transition to go along. That includes moving for governments to including them as a first mover in this space. So we've seen Seattle and other places being the first mover to buy electric buses instead of those uh, gaseous uh, diesel having to eat it. I know you hate it when you're on your bike and you're smoking that diesel smoke. We'd rather uh, know there's a lithium ion battery ahead of you. That includes the state of Washington. We're buying 120 all, excuse me, we're uh, moving our uh, uh, fleet very dramatically to all electric vehicles and when we buy cars, for the state of Washington, we're now buying all electric cars. So we're moving full speed ahead of my administration goal to have 50,000 electric vehicles on the road by 2020 in very realistic ways. Now we believe, and I've long believed, this transition is going to move faster than we thought because I've always believed that battery technology would move faster than people thought. And that actually is happening. We're leading in battery technology in the state of Washington. And by the way, the people who think of clean energy as only an environmental benefit, take a look at the job creation benefits of energy and clean energy in our state. Three weeks ago, I went to an unveiling of the largest vanadium flow battery grid scale battery in the world today at UET in Muckleteal. This is a company that is now selling 44 megawatts of grid scale electricity to Germany. Uh, I saw the plant, they're shipping down to Tennessee and they're putting people to work. The number one rate of job creation of any industry in the United States today is clean energy. If you want to see a clean energy job creation strategy, come to the state of Washington. Because I'll show you thousands of people who are not only saving the planet from climate change, but they're taking a paycheck home. And those are both beautiful things. And we're doing it in great, great strides uh, in places across the state of Washington. Bellingham at iTech, where we're doing the, one of the world's most cost-effective photoelectric uh, cells. In Moses Lake, where we have the largest manufacturer of carbon fiber uh, in the world uh, uh, today. In Spokane, when we're selling green products uh, on, on through eBay. We are moving the needle on clean energy job creation and I'm excited to be part of this. Now we're doing something else that sometimes is forgotten that is necessary to level the playing field for solar energy and the electrification of the car. And that is to level the playing field when it comes to the costs of eliminating waste products. 
Today, the coal industry gets to use our atmosphere as a dumping ground for their pollution at zero cost in unlimited amounts. I was proud of President Barack Obama. I said, we're not going to allow that anymore. We're going to put a limit on carbon dioxide. And I want to tell you, Donald Trump is wrong when he wants to allow unlimited pollution from coal-fired plants in the United States. And we should fight his effort on this every single day. He is wrong on this. But we are not waiting to win that battle in Washington, D.C. We're doing it right here in Washington State. And I'm proud to stand to you as the governor who put into place an executive order pursuant to our state clean air rule. We have today, as law, a limitation on the amount of carbon dioxide that comes from our largest polluting industries in the state of Washington. We're being sued on this, but guess what? Science is on our side. The law is on our side, economics is on our side, and the ability of our grandkids to have a beautiful Washington state is on our side. We're going to continue unabated having a limit on carbon dioxide in our state. We're not rolling this backwards. It's the right thing for the state of Washington. So I just want to thank you for this opportunity to come up and talk about the alpha and omega of clean energy. And uh, Mr. President, I'm understanding that you're going to now uh, lob some softball questions from these brilliant students. And uh, uh, one of those questions cannot be, what are quantum dots? Because I can't tell you. <laughs> but I'm sure you'll give me one I can't answer. So the floor is open for questions. Happy to stand for great, great questions this morning. Who wants to fire at the governor here? Have at him. Certainly you've got some easy questions. <clears throat> Well, we wish we would exclusively uh, use it for these efforts. I can't tell you on, on how to do that. We do have an impediment, unfortunately, uh, still uh, in our democracy. And that is, unfortunately, that um, we only have one team that will help on these issues. And that's only one of our great uh, political parties who have embraced the science of climate change and who are looking for avenues to find investment into clean energy research. Uh, I have been able to establish Clean Energy Research Institute. I've been able to uh, impose uh, this limitation on carbon dioxide, but frankly we've been fought tooth and nail by uh, one of the other great parties and that's been very disturbing. So when we get things like this, I always look for avenues to make better investments, but I have to fight tooth and nail to make that happen. Uh, I'll look for this uh, to keep this battle going. This year, uh, uh, I have proposed as one of the possible ways to finance this McCleary decision and need grants and tuition relief and a better operating budget and a way to pay the people who work here in the collective bargaining agreements is instead of taxing people when they buy shoes, or clothes or milk, tax pollution. Because if you're going to have to raise money, why don't we tax pollution? Because then we get not only money for schools, we get less pollution. That's a twofer. So I'm hoping legislators will uh, continue to consider this to establish a price on pollution. That's one tool we need. Eventually, we're going to get there. I hope we can consider that discussion. Yes. I tell you, why don't you uh, figure out who's going to answer the question here? Oh, thank you, Governor. Uh, my name is Kellen Lynch, and I'm a student with the Institute for Energy Studies. Um, I've noticed that a lot of local industry, including iTech, and our work here at the university depends on subsidies, solar subsidies, being extended past the 2020 deadline. Uh, what can we do, and what are you doing to uh, push that forward so we can have sustainable growth? Well, you can, uh, the first, first thing you can do is elect legislators who don't think climate change is a Chinese hoax. So they will help us adopt policies to make sure that's the case. And I'm serious about that. It is frankly, given the state of this science, that we still have legislators who won't help pull on this rope is, is very frustrating. So that's job number one. You get to do that every couple years in this community. By the way, that's not a partisan statement, okay? I'm not being partisan here at all. 
But I'm just saying we need legislators to understand climate change and clean energy. Number two, you can talk to your existing legislators about how important this is and how effective this is in, in creating jobs. And number three, and this is important, and this is actually, I'm going to make a personal request of all the young people, that means uh, people under the age of 55, um, in this room. And I'm very serious about this. Um, I'd really ask you to get to know your legislator and tell them your personal story. Tell them why you're excited about this. Tell them why you're inspired by this. Because I'll tell you, there's nothing more effective than a young person with a fire in their eyes about, I want to go invent a new way to make a, a window into a photoelectric cell. I can tell you, when, when old legislators hear an inspiring like, the story like that, even they can get excited. So I'm very, I really, it's a personal request. Get to know a legislator. Go tell them why you're interested in this. You can really uh, change minds. I hope you'll do that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Hello, my name's Paul. I'm an environmental journalist here on campus. And I was curious uh, if you're in support of the Tesoro Clean Products Upgrade Project that's going under pre review right now. Well, there's a permitting process that I think you're probably referring to. And uh, during permitting processes, I cannot express an opinion, yes or no, on permits, because I have to wait till the entire permitting process is concluded. So we have multiple permits now in Western Washington pertaining to projects involving fossil fuels. And I can't express an opinion on any of them because I have to preserve my open-mindedness during the permitting process. So I can't give you a black or white answer. What I can tell you is that we are rigorous in understanding the consequences, both from a safety, public health, and environmental standard of these projects. And I have been challenged on that. I'll give you an example. We have insisted on, on our environmental impact statements that we have uh, assessed the, uh, the carbon dioxide emissions associated with some of these, the products these plants produce. I think that's the right thing because Washingtonians deserve to have that information when we make these permitting decisions. So I can, I can tell you we are going to follow the law, we're going to follow the science, and we're going to make sure Washingtonians have the information they deserve before any of these decisions are made, pro or con. I hope Thank you're you. active. Thank you. Well, I've started on this effort a long time ago when we started the Renewable Portfolio Standard. You'll recall the legislators would not act, so myself and a bunch of others, we went out and passed an initiative that created a Renewable Portfolio Standard that required an additional percentage of our portfolio to come from, from clean, renewable sources in addition to hydroelectric. Because our hydroelectric is quite limited, and we have to develop new sources. And that has been spectacularly successful. We have created a multi-billion dollar industry in the wind industry in the state of Washington when people just said they were fancy little toys 10 years ago. We now have a billion dollar industry. My son's kid just went to work in a, in a company that's now citing wind industry. So I'm always alert for uh, opportunities to continue to build these other industries. As far as the breaching issue, uh, the first thing we have to do is to improve fish runs even under the current architecture. And uh, I am working with folks to inspire them to do that. We're going to have to do some additional work, particularly to increase the downstream uh, time it takes for salmon smokes to get down the river. We have to increase the survival rate while they get downriver to the ocean. And that's going to require some changes in the operations of the river. Um, that's number one. The court has required the um, uh, uh, the affected states and BPA to start considering this issue, that's going to have to be complied with. So I'm going to follow what the court mandate has said in that regard. Mr. Governor, thanks for coming and speaking with us today. Uh, 
My name is Andy, and I'm an electrical engineering student uh, in part of the energy concentration here at uh, the school. And you know, there's a imminent decommissioning of the Columbia Generating Station down in Hanford, and uh, I was curious on how you felt about how uh, you know nuclear, even though it's 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 carbon neutral, it is you know not necessarily clean energy, and how you felt about uh, nuclear being part of the clean energy portfolio moving forward, if at all. Yeah, just to ask you, you said an imminent decommissioning. Did I miss something? Well, the, the plant's approaching 30 years old, and a nuclear plant has only so much it. life to it. So, you know, it. There, it, it provides one gigawatt of, of baseload power for a state. Right. And so at some point, that's going to go away yeah. next five, ten years. So yeah. just kind of curious, uh, um, you know, your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Thank you. I thought I missed a headline this morning. So I... <laughs> <laughs> So nuclear is a, a nuanced issue, which is always dangerous when you talk about nuances, but I will attempt to do that. So my belief is that the, the, the need is, is so uh, great for uh, non and low CO2 emissions systems that we should have an open mind to technologies that are low CO2 and non CO2 emitting. And we should not have ideological blinders to wall off any particular technology. That's where I start the discussion on nuclear. Many people do not take that approach. Many people just wall it off as we're never going to look at nuclear regardless. I don't take that position because I think the need for, for low CO2 emitting sources is significant enough that we have to continue to keep an open eye and make decisions based on science and technology rather than ideology. So that's where I start the discussion. Uh, in order for nuclear power to become a, any, any significant part of the future, future portfolio, certain things would have to happen, which have not happened yet. Number one, you have to find a disposal system for the waste that is long-term and is safe, that the public accepts. We do not have a long-term disposal system today. Temporary in-site storage right now is not acceptable in the long term. You have to have a 10,000-year solution. We do not have that today. So that would have to be surmounted before nuclear would become uh, a viable uh, uh, possibility. The second would be, should just be cost. So the cost today really is not competitive. And this is one of the great kind of misnomers. Jane Fonda didn't really sort of kill uh, nuclear energy. It was just the cost. There were lower cost alternatives, if you will. So there would have to be significant strides in the cost of nuclear energy to become competitive today, particularly because solar is coming down so dramatically so quickly. So those lines would have to cross at some point. Today there is some research in modular nuclear reactors which have some promise to be significantly less expensive. Uh, I am not opposed to doing that research. I think that we ought to continue to do research on anything that has low CO2 emitting possibilities. So I would not be opposed to continuing that research. But as far as deployment, we've got to have a solution for the waste. We would have to show that these have an increased safety standard, which we do not have today. The Fukushima event was a wake-up call. I met with the ambassador of Japan the other day, and the consequences of that are so profound, uh, it ought to give us pause about any safety standards. So the third would have to be we would have to have an increased level of safety that the public would be acceptive of for, you know, 10,000 years. So those three things uh, would have to happen in my regard. What do you think? I share your sentiment. It's uh, it, it 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 is carbon neutral, so it has to be considered. But at the state that we have it now, it's 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 just one two unsafe, and it, it, you, there's nothing to do with the waste. So, if those if those solutions can be breached, then I think it's a viable solution that should be considered. Uh, but as of now, I, I don't see it as as something that um, is possible to move forward with until we figure that out. Uh, and and if you don't mind. Uh, can that segue into a conversation of geothermal energy? Mm -hmm. Because in this state we have, uh, you know, volcanic activity and, and, and the sort of heat that's necessary, but yet it's kind of untapped, so. I, I think this is, a, is something we should have more research on in development. We have a company called Alter Rock down in Seattle, which is a world leading recovery, and it doesn't even have to be volcanic. It's just perfecting the technology to be able to have that energy transfer I'm high on it. I've been supportive of research and development. I'll continue uh, to do so. 
uh, I think there's still a lot of possibilities there. Thank you. Can I say one more thing before I go? I had a person in an EE degree. I think I might have had somebody I talked to in a chemistry degree. I want to tell you how I feel about you, and I'm being very sincere about this. You guys are my heroes, and I want to, be, I want to tell you that. I want you to feel like heroes. I want you to be empowered like heroes, because if you are, you're going to save my grandkids. So thanks for your work. Keep it up. Take care. Okay, I just want to say welcome again, everybody, and thank you for joining us at our second, I'm not ready to say second annual yet, but our second energy symposium. Uh, as you could see, we, we kind of uh, had to adjust the schedule to make room for our special guests. It was really great to have the governor here, and I, I, I feel like I should reassure all of you longtime Bellingham residents that when he talked about the Institute for Energy Studies in Western uh, becoming kind of the uh, center of excitement, that it, it will be a subdued excitement. <laughs> so if, if we're all reassured by that, I'd like to go on. Um, many of you are faculty or, or students or uh, board members or collaborators with the Institute for Energy Studies, uh, but if I could just take a quick second and uh, describe what it is that we're doing here at Western. Uh, we think it's uh, still a pretty new and innovative program and relatively unique and important uh, in the world of, of energy and, and uh, higher education. The Institute for Energy Studies is an explicitly interdisciplinary program uh, of coursework in education for undergraduates and potentially master's students uh, that we have here at Western. Every one of our programs has a mix of coursework in science and technology, business and economics, as well as policy. And each concentration, each major obviously has, has more depth in, in, in one or more of those fields, uh, but all have each of those components. And it's a very um, intentional but very delicate balance that we're trying to strike, creating programs that have that kind of a breadth, but that also have real depth where the students uh, can graduate with a skill set and a toolkit to go out uh, into business, government, industry, nonprofit sector, uh, and, and be able to hit the ground running as, as staff, as employees, perhaps even as entrepreneurs uh, in the field. At the moment, we have uh, a couple of degrees and a couple of minors. We have an energy policy minor that's been around for a few years. We have an energy science minor that's relatively new. We have a ba Bachelor of Arts degree in energy policy and management, with obviously a focus on policy and, and business. We have a uh, very technical energy concentration in our also rather new electrical engineering major. That's a, a Bachelor of Science degree. And we also have brand new, um, just uh, approved a new energy concentration in the business and sustainability major in the College of Business and Economics. Uh, thanks to Craig Dunn for helping push that through. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the, the founding director of the Institute, Andy Bunn, who actually had to step out because he's got class. But Andy founded the Institute um, along with several of our other uh, key faculty and um, began to assemble our, our excellent advisory board uh, a few years back. And really where it came from was he was teaching environmental science courses where the students were coming in and saying, you know, we're, we're studying all these problems and learning about pollution and climate change and, and they're, they're, they're really um, severe problems and it, you know, it gets kind of depressing. Do we ever work on solutions? And he thought and said, well, you have to learn about energy. And that was really the stimulation, uh, the impetus to, to create the program. And we continue to really try to push towards positioning our students to find those solutions, to invent those solutions, to implement them. Uh, and, and a lot of the things that the governor said, I think, uh, reinforces that. Um, and, and since that time, we've, we've assembled a really excellent group of advisors uh, on our um, Institute for Energy Studies advisory board 
and other uh, collaborators, several of whom you'll hear as speakers and others who are here. Uh, hopefully you can meet. We're, tr we're trying to build in enough uh, break time that we can all do some good networking and, and, uh, and schmoozing. Um, I want to uh, make a few more um, thank yous to um, uh, sponsors uh, directly of the symposium. Uh, we have a panel sponsor for this afternoon, uh, PACAR, and we want to thank them. And we'll have a, a speaker also. I want to thank our lunch sponsor, Cascade Natural Gas, the utility that serves our natural gas uh, and energy efficiency programs uh, here. Thank you to Cascade Natural Gas. Our presenting sponsor is Philip 66 Ferndale Refinery. So thanks to Philip 66 uh, for being the presenting sponsor of the symposium. And then we have an event sponsor. We want to, train, we want to thank Train Climate Solutions. Uh, and I especially want to thank Warren Michelson, who's here. And Warren, if you could come up. Warren has been one of the, um, well, really, the fa one of the founding uh, board members. And I have a little plaque for you and Train. Uh, thank you. Thanking you for, for your sponsorship of the symposium, but also being one of the founding uh, advisors for the Institute for Energy Studies and you know you've been a great help uh, and supporter of the Institute and given us great advice on how to how to design and position the, the programs uh, for both the, the the students benefit but also thinking from the, the standpoint of industry so thanks again thank you really appreciate it. So, so I want to thank Manka for uh, inv inviting me to say a couple words here and then reminding me five minutes before that I had to say a couple words. But thank you very much for this recognition. I want to tell you it's both a privilege and an honor for TRAIN to be uh, participating with both Western and Energy Institute in this important uh, public-private partnership and commit that we'll continue to support our students and the Institute uh, as we move forward. So thank you very much. One more special thanks, uh, and many of the students will, will know where I'm coming from. Um, it really took a lot of people around the university to, to organize and to, to stage the event. Um, and I want to thank one person in particular who's been instrumental in doing a lot of the um, organizing and um, uh, making sure the arrangements are made. Um, and the, the students will realize that our um, program advisor in the Institute for Energy Studies, Gail Cowan, who's been instrumental in everything we do, was also instrumental in uh, making sure that everything worked and the trains ran on time and we herded the cats and we all got here. And I just wanted to thank Gail and wish her happy birthday. And, and we're, we're, we're borrowing your plant here for the um, podium de uh, decoration, but this, this is your, uh, your birthday present from all of us. And I, and I also have a, a bottle of, of uh, Dr. Pepper here. <laughs> so thanks, Gail, and really on behalf of the students, uh, you know, I know you've really been kind of the soul of the, of the Institute for Energy Studies on, in, in terms of, of creating some of the, the, the programs and the connections, and we really appreciate it. Uh, I also want to thank our panel moderators, Ross McFarlane, who you'll hear from uh, shortly, uh, Galen Hahn, who will be um, moderating one of the panels in the afternoon, Christine Grant, uh, also moderating one of our panels this afternoon. So those, those are all the folks that I wanted to say thanks to. Um, and uh, now I wanted to go ahead with, with our first um, uh, part of the program. Uh, to kick that off, I want to more formally introduce Ross McFarland. Ross has been a, another one of our founding uh, advisory board members, um, and he's been the, really the, the program chair for this uh, symposium event, uh, and has really been uh, the person that uh, identified uh, the speakers and recruited them and has organized uh, the agenda, and I want to thank you, Ross, for doing that. Um, Ross is um, kind of a reformed corporate lawyer, I think we could say. 
Uh, he was at uh, K&L Gates uh, for, for some time uh, more recently. Uh, he was uh, at um, Climate Solutions, a prominent nonprofit in, in the uh, clean energy space, uh, in their, running their business partnership program. And Ross has recently retired from Climate Solutions, and we were very relieved that he was able to squeeze us in between the other bucket list um, items that were being checked off. And um, Ross, I'll turn it over to you to, uh, to kick off the next part of this uh, program. Thanks. Thank you all. What a great room. This is so exciting to be here. And uh, it's fabulous to have Gavin Rinsley get us off to such a great, inspiring start this morning. You know, I, I just want to start by saying that it's been a real honor. Uh, I, I was comparing notes with Manka. It was actually seven years ago that Manka Vallum, who I'm sure most of you know, really the straw that stirs the drink of the whole um, energy program here and helped make it happen after Andy and the students had decided they wanted to do it, seven years ago that she said, gosh, do you think there'd be some interest in the, in the business and nonprofit community around people who care about energy if we started to explore doing something, which is really a unique program, first in the nation, interdisciplinary, cutting across every different discipline, focused on undergraduates, learning about the future of a rapidly changing field of, of energy. And it's just been tremendous how much enthusiasm was generated with the, uh, all my fellow advisory board members, other people in the community, and exciting to see under Joel's leadership how far this program has come. And so I'm excited to, to be here in the second symposium, and I'm hoping, Joel, that it is a second annual symposium for the Energy Institute. So um, as we looked at last year, for those of you who are here, know that we did a, a program focused on the electric grid, on all of the exciting innovations, solar power, uh, wind power, other renewables, battery storage, all the things that are transforming the electrical sector and the challenges for that sector moving forward. And so we decided to do something different this year and focus really on what's the other side of the energy equation, which is the transportation sector, mobility, how people get around, which as um, I think many of you know is in Washington state, larger source of our carbon emissions, largest source of our pollution, um, because we have a relatively clean electric power grid that is rapidly getting cleaner. And it's also the area of the greatest challenge because it's very divided between freight, between aviation, between Trans, uh, personal transportation between all these different sectors. And each of those sectors has some particularly unique challenges of what are the energy sources that are going to be used for that? How can it be more efficient in using energy? How can we make the changes that are needed? And there's exciting and really unique changes happening in those sectors. So we were really excited in, in being able to put together the panels you're going to hear from this afternoon talking about new mobility in aviation, in um, freight, in uh, the personal transportation, personal vehicles, et cetera, and excited with all the folks who've taken time from their businesses and, and their nonprofits and their government work to be able to come with you today. But I also thought it was important to have a framing conversation to start with, something that lays out essentially what are the key factors? And so we're not just hearing uh, a series of disparate remarks, but we also have some kind of a context to put that in. And as we thought about that and we're putting things together, I realized that I couldn't ask anyone better to do the initial framing conversation than our next speaker, uh, Eileen Quigley. I was very honored to be Eileen's colleague at Climate Solutions for most of the last decade. Um, Eileen ran the, uh, what we called the solutions work um, at Climate Solutions uh, as the director of strategic innovation, managing things like our new energy cities program, our work around biocarbons, our work around aviation fuels. Before that, she has a long career as a journalist, um, as a serial entrepreneur in the nonprofit and private sectors, um, and as an innovator in all areas of her life. She's talked about clean energy transition and clean energy innovations everywhere from Seattle to Hamburg, Germany. 
um, and is currently on the board of the Stockholm Environment Institute, which is one of the leading things. Also, as a serial entrepreneur, uh, Eileen has recently started a new venture, which I encourage people to check out online, called cleanenergytransitions.net. Eileen's going to do a brief framing presentation, and then we're going to have a panel where Joel and I will be able to also talk about and answer questions on what's next in the energy world and what you might be expecting to hear from later today. Eileen. Governor might have left his book here. Is this the governor's book? <laughs> I think the governor's daily schedule and speech is here. Which I <laughs> so I'm going to give that to you. <laughs> and at what point? At what, what point is he going to discover that? <laughs> and who gets to come back to pick it up? Now I just have to make sure which button is this that I push. Yeah, I think we might want to get that to him. Where's my tech guy? Which button do I push for advance? This one? Right there? Is that it? No? There we go. No? That doesn't look good. All right, perfect. Sorry for that technical moment. Um, first of all, I'd like to express my thanks to Western for inviting me here. I've had the pleasure at Climate Solutions of having several Western interns work for me, and I can tell you that they are exceptional. They have actually been the best interns I had. I ran an internship program at Climate Solutions and generally had anywhere from seven to 10 interns in a given year from all around the country. But the interns from Western were really top notch and just hit the ground running right at the beginning. And one of the reasons is because of the writing requirement. So for all the students here who may not enjoy the writing requirement, those of us out here in the real world who get to work with you really appreciate the writing requirement. Um, I'd also like to thank Joel and Ross. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to take a minute to point out Jamie Dodon, who's right there. And Jamie ha has been working with me as my research analyst. And so if you have questions about my presentation, you can also speak to Jamie. Uh, he knows exactly as much as I do today. <laughs> Um, and then the last thing is, is that we are going to make the PowerPoint available with the notes section. There are a lot of notes in the, uh, in the notes section of the PowerPoint that I won't be able to cover. And so for the students who are interested in learning more, please feel free to request it or maybe Joel will just put it up somewhere on a listserv. Okay, so I was given the assignment today to set the stage uh, for this afternoon, as Ross just explained, and in particular to explain why transportation is such a critical part of addressing climate and clean energy and why it is so challenged to decarbonize the transportation sector. So I'm going to look at uh, freight, aviation, marine, and passenger vehicles, and look at the different low carbon pathways for each. Um, and in, then we're, I'm going to talk about primarily fuel efficiency and fuel switching, not as much on the vehicle miles traveled reductions because this is primarily about the energy. So let's just start with grounding ourselves and where we are in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. We're going to start looking at globally, transportation sector emissions account for 14% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And while the transport sector, if that's globally, and then the transport sector in the United States counts for about 26% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Does that work? Okay. Um, now digging down a little bit deeper, when you look into the transportation sector, you see that cars and trucks account for 72% of greenhouse gas emissions globally, broken down between 23% for medium and heavy duty vehicles and 49% for light duty vehicles. 
In the United States, the fee figure is even higher. It's 84% of transport for uh, greenhouse gas emissions are due to cars and trucks, with light duty vehicles comprising 61% and heavy duty trucks equaling 23%. So let's zoom in a little bit closer to home and we'll look at Washington and Oregon. So here we see that Washington's transport sector contributes about 46% of greenhouse gas emissions, while in Oregon it's 37%. And then again, looking at the breakdown, um, we see that about 70% of Washington's uh, transport GHG is found in cars, 50%, I mean, just combined cars, 50%, and trucks, 20%. Aviation is about 17%, and marine is 9%. In Oregon, we didn't have the exact comparison. We didn't have marine sector data, but we can see that aviation in Oregon is about half of Washington, and diesel and gasoline take up a larger portion of GHG emissions, 31% and 59%, respectively. Okay, so let's start with freight. Um, we see that trucks haul 70% of all freight tonnage that moves in the United States, and rail is a distant second at 16%. And while heavy-duty freight trucks make up only 5% of all U.S. vehicles, they contribute 23% of all U.S. GHG emissions, as we just saw in the prior slide. Equally important to note is that heavy trucks hauling freight are the fastest growing emission source in the transportation sector, and they are expected to increase 80% in terms of vehicle miles traveled nationally by 2050, and to eclipse cars for GHG emissions in 2030 globally. There are a number of market-ready technologies that will improve truck fuel economy. In the 2014, the Union of Concerned Scientists did an analysis that looked at how to meet a target of a 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2025. So improvements that would reduce the aerodynamics, the weight, the rolling resistance of trucks, these all reduce the amount of fuel that is needed to pull freight. Transportation improvements reduce fr friction and they keep engines operating at their most efficient which is an improvement that's important for trucks, all trucks, not just big rigs. Another option is to improve the engine itself, capturing heat that would normally be wasted as exhaust and use that energy to improve the output of the engine. The Union of Concerned Scientists, find, scientists found that vehicle efficiency measures such as these could save 1.5 million barrels of oil every day and keep nearly 270 million metric tons of, of global warming emissions out of the atmosphere every year by 2025. Electric and hybrid electric trucks may also play a role in reducing oil usage and global warming. In this slide, we look at um, two, we, we're gonna talk a bit about the corporate average fuel economy standards, otherwise known as the CAFE standards. And we're talking about the ones that they were enacted in 1975 to reduce consumption by increasing fuel economy for cars and light trucks. And the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency estimate that these standards for in the freight sector will save 1.1 billion metric tons of carbon pollution over the lifetime of vehicles. And by 2027, the total fuel savings is estimated to be about 170 billion over the lifetime of vehicles. And as you can see in the graphic on the left, you can see the percentage of how it breaks down by the different types of vehicles. So in a buyer of a 2027 long haul truck will recoup their investment in fuel efficient technology in less than two years. However, Complying with the CAFE standards requires tractor trailers only to be about 8% more efficient by 2027. And while the Union Concerned Scientists study that I was just discussing finds that what's really needed to address the global warming crisis is a 46% reduction in fuel for heavy duty trucks. And delivery vans and heavy uh, duty pickup trucks should be in about the 30% range. So, the good news is, is that the CAFE standards for trucks are approved, they're on the books, and, they are not, and they're not subject to review as the passenger vehicle ones are, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
but they are far too little for the aggressive reduction that the climate demands. Another way to address uh, freight is with fuel switching. And so the graph on the left here shows modeling that was done by the University of, of California at Davis, researchers who explored the feasibility of reducing mid and heavy truck emissions by 80% compared to 1990 levels by 2050. So the blue line shows a high zero emission vehicle scenario, or a ZEV, high ZEV scenario, which would meet the 80 by 50 goal. For trucks, that would be most likely hydrogen fuel cell and possibly plug-in electric vehicles. This very aggressive modeling requiring sales, this is very aggressive modeling, and it would require sales of ZEV models to begin in 2020 and increase rapidly to get to the 100% mark by 2040. The red line is showing a mixed scenario, which only requires the ZEV um, portion to be about half of the blue line, and the rest would be relying on an aggressive ramping up of advanced biofuels. Some points to make that underscore the difficulty of addressing the carbon in the freight sector. So, both scenarios assume significant energy efficiency improvements, and those, but those largely serve to offset what would be the increases in miles traveled. So a critical point here is that reductions of carbon intensity must accompany fuel efficiency to achieve the deep reductions that are required. Second point, there is no precedent for such rapid adoption of a new form of propulsion. Third, there are no ZEV truck mandates yet. Fourth, there are significant challenges to ramping up advanced biofuels that have lower carbon footprints to produce, including the availability of the feedstocks and the production facilities, as well as competition for other uses, other modes that would use the same fuels. And we'll address this a little bit later when we talk about aviation. Finally, the costs of ZEV technologies and advanced biofuels must also drop. It's reasonable to assume that fuel cells and battery electric trucks will be cost competitive by 2030, but the transition costs over the next 15 years are likely to be substantial. With regard to hybrid and electric powered trucks, they're possible for lighter short haul vehicles that have a limited number of miles to travel and return to their bases frequently. So examples of this would be at ports, rail yards, where hybrid and electric vehicles are being tested to move cargo containers. Um, heavy duty, long haul vehicles will likely use fuel cell technologies in the future and biodiesel. Now I had put that it seemed unlikely at this stage that a fully electrified big truck will be feasible soon. And then, of course, Tesla announced <laughs> last week that they will be introducing a semi-electric truck in September. <laughs> so um, this just underscores how dynamic this industry is. So let's move to aviation. Aviation comprises 2% of total greenhouse gas emissions, but it is a growing sector expected to be anywhere between 2 and 4.4% of overall GHG emissions by 2050 if nothing happens. But the aviation industry has set a goal of reducing sector global, their sector emissions 50% by 2050. And so even though it may only, only be 2%, when each of us looks at our own personal carbon footprints and we account for flying, if we fly, it's a huge part of our carbon footprint. Other key drivers for advanced biofuels for aviation include the significant impact that oil prices swings have on the airline's bottom line. So fuel is the largest cost of an airline company, and when oil prices rise and fall, it can be very challenging for the companies. Another is national security concerns. We've seen an enormous amount of activity in the military, the US military, which is very concerned about climate change for not only for climate security reasons and the instability around the globe, but also for the f refueling their supply lines. So there's been a lot of interest and a lot of impetus from the military to develop um, 
uh, advanced biofuels for aviation. And then finally, of course, there are the climate considerations. This is a, a wedge analysis that um, shows if you trace the red line going up, that's a business as usual uh, scenario, which anticipates somewhere between a 3 to 4.7 percent uh, rise in total emissions by 2050 um, without concerted action. So each of these wedges represents different actions to take along the road to 2050, starting with improvements in fuel efficiency, which you can see in the first part uh, to 1.5 percent between at this point when this was done, 2010 to 2020. Um, capping net emissions from 2020 through carbon neutral growth to arrive at a net aviation emissions at half of what they were in 2005. So I'm actually not going to walk you through this entire slide in detail, <laughs> which you'll probably be grateful for. Um, but what you should take away from it is that there is enormous complexity in the field of sustainable aviation fuels with multiple processes in development and only a few that are certified to pro process biofuels. Um, yes, And that even once certification is achieved, there are many complications with getting the fuel to the planes. Some of the challenges with decarbonizing aviation include the fact that planes can't be easily powered by electricity to travel long distances with large cargo and multiple passengers at one time. Planes need fuels that drop into existing infrastructure for fuel delivery for aircraft. The process for developing these drop-in fuels are technical, complicated, and highly regulated. There are a variety of feedstocks in development, and each of which has a different pathway to market and challenging barriers to overcome. Further, as with other biofuels applications, we have the food versus fuel debate. So controversy over whether land should be used to grow fuel, grow crops for people, to feed people, or whether they should be used to grow fuel for transportation. And as we discussed a little bit further with freight, when you see the increase in the growth of freight, the sector is going to be increasingly competing for the same biofuels. However, in 2016, for the very first time, biojet fuel was supplied using existing airport fueling infrastructure, which is a major milestone. And Airbus is working on a completely electric plane that would go 1,000 kilometers by 2100. So hybrid electric planes have a long way to go, so biojet fuel is the focus. Now we're going to move to marine. Marine shipping is currently the least carbon intensive form of freight hauling. It's slightly better than rail and on average one tenth of carbon intensive as heavy duty travel trucks and one one hundredth as carbon intensive as air freight. So that means that switching freight hauling methods to ships, what is known as short sea shipping, is beneficial whenever possible. So emissions are expected to increase anywhere from 50 to 250 percent, so wide estimates under business as usual projections, with total fuel consumption dominated by three types of ships, oil tankers, container ships, and bulk carriers. The International Maritime Organization, or the IMO, is the only organization to have adopted energy efficiency measures that are legally binding across the entire global industry. So according to the IMO projections, improvements in efficiency have a larger impact on emission trajectories than switching the fuel mix to liquefied natural gas. Under the current IMO standards, which were enacted in 2013, all new ships in 2025 are to be 30 percent more efficient than those built in 2014. There are many in the industry who think that these could even be more ambitious. There are a number of different options for improving a ship's efficiency. Aerodynamics, thrust efficiency, energy efficiency, and hydrodynamics. Here too are a few that we'll highlight, looking at the graphic in the lower left corner of the slide from the International Council on Clean Transportation. So hydrodynamics, which is cleaning and smoothing the hull, adopting hull coating technologies that use special polymers or air bubbles, 
that could result in about a 15% efficiency improvement. And you can see a picture on the right of those technologies being applied. Thrust efficiency would be propeller polishing, which can result in a 3 to an 8% efficiency increase and is the most cost-effective option, according to the International uh, Council on Clean Transportation. And its benefits far outweigh its capital costs. And then energy engine efficiency would be combined cycle engines, which recover waste from heat, waste heat, and are then used um, to increase the efficiency between 6 and 8 percent. Nearly all of these options are highly cost effective, which makes them something that ships marine industry will largely focus on. Here, talking a little bit about operations efficiency, in addition to the design of the ship, there are a number of operations practices that can make the industry more efficient. Vessel speed reduction is the single largest fuel use reduction opportunity, up to 30%. But that, of course, has the negative impact of the fuel, not, of the, what's being shipped not getting where it needs to be as soon as the operators might want it. So some others to consider are autopilot. This is improving autopilot technologies can improve efficiency by up to 3%. Weather routing which is address, addressing, adjusting routing based on weather can improve efficiency up to 4%. And then fleet optimization, which is improved practices in managing the shipping logistics, increasing the ship's use, adding more load, and managing and connecting the fleet. The image to the right is an intelligent ship that Rolls-Royce is developing, which is fully autonomous and can be remotely controlled, connected to other ships in the fleet, and fully censored to provide data for performance monitoring and predictive maintenance. It's also designed for route and speed optimization. So this ship also has the advantage, since it's autonomous, of removing the need to build space for crew, which allows more opportunity to load more freight. In general, the world of data and analytics is being unleashed on the shipping industry to create smart shipping and increase efficiency. And the last marine slide is on fuel switching. Uh, the table you see here is from the Pew Center for Climate Change, and it compares emissions from the marine sector of 2007 to 2050. So operations and ship efficiency methods are a significant portion of the mitigation potentials for, for, uh, to, uh, to lower from the business as usual scenario. But switching to alternative fuels will also be necessary to keep emissions roughly in line with the 2007 levels. The images on the right are of an all-electric, zero-emissions ferry that is operating in Norway now, and it rapidly charges at each end of the, its trip. So as the ferry is loading and unloading, it charges up, and then it does its, uh, its uh, cross, goes across the water. Below is an image of a proposed universal transfer station for an LNG fueling operation. So LNG is liquefied natural gas, which is produced when gas is cooled, natural gas is cooled, and then liquefied. So with current technology, most of the potential lies in transitioning from heavy fuel to some form of natural gas, likely li liquefied natural gas. So benefits of liquefied natural gas are a 90% reduction in nitro nitrogen oxide, which is what creates smog, and then close to 100% reduction in sulfur oxide, and that causes acid rain. The impacts on greenhouse gas emissions depend heavily, however, on the amount of what's known as methane slip. And that is when methane leaks out either in the production, the distribution, or the combustion of the natural gas. And methane has a 28 to 30 percent greater global warming potential. So the methane slip issue is a real problem. Let's see. Okay. Um, building the infrastructure necessary to fuel ships for LNG globally is also extremely costly. And so, and they're and reg heavily regulated. And now we get to passenger vehicles, the last segment. 
Okay, I've left the most dynamic <laughs> to last. Um, so, there are multiple possibilities in the vehicle sector for efficiency, for all types of alternative fuel, VMT, uh, vehicle miles traveled reduction with land use decisions. This is a rapidly developing area and it's extremely difficult to predict where it's going to go, how quickly it will expand. Deployment estimates for electric vehicles and for autonomous vehicles are wildly different. So there's lots of opportunity, but many challenges. So now let's talk about the CAFE standards a little bit. So the CAFE standards for passenger vehicles, um, in the Obama administration, in the waning days of the Obama administration, uh, issued rules that would uh, uh, guide um, the 2022 to 2025 standards um, in December of 2016. So these standards were significantly strengthened under the Obama's uh, administration. And the graph on the left shows projected emissions from light duty vehicles compared to 2010 with and without the standards. This has a huge impact, a net 600 million megaton uh, change in carbon emissions. And I would also just note from my work at the New Energy Cities program, which I ran for several years, uh, what we do in that program is we help cities map their energy sources and do carbon wedge analyses of their different uh, decarbonization pathways. And one of the major pieces of the city's uh, efforts to get back down to a baseline emissions in 2010 or 2015 is the CAFE standards. So the minute that the CAFE standards end up being removed from that wedge analysis, the cities now have an even more difficult job, and they already have an exceptionally difficult time addressing transportation emissions. So that it's impossible to underscore how important the CAFE standards are. Uh, the chart on the right, it shows you that achieving these standards uh, uh, is not all about EV adoption. It's in fact, the EV line is just that small silver uh, sliver at the top. But there's a wide range of technologies that can help us get to the CAFE standards. These include turbo engines, hybrids, cylinder deactivated engines, more efficient transmission systems, mass reductions in, um, in, in cars and light uh, trucks, and also aerodynamic improvements. So what's going to happen with the CAFE standards? Well, as probably everybody in this room knows, the Trump administration, at the urging of the auto industry, recently decided to reopen the evaluation of the standards. They were due to be evaluated in uh, April of 2018, or by April of 2018, anyway, um, because that had been something the auto industry had required be in the statute. Um, but the Trump administration decided to accelerate that. So. In the notes on the slide, there's an enormous amount of detail on what, it, what the state of play is for whether or not the CAFE standards are going to be changed, um, just how hard it will be for that to happen. Um, I think the main point that I would say is that it's not easy, and at a minimum, it's going to involve a lot of lawyers. Another thing I would like to say is that the market itself is already betting big on electric vehicles. And as we know, Tesla's market cap recently passed both Ford and GM's. Um, Volkswagen is trying to sell a million electric vehicles by 2025. Mercedes-Benz has 10 new electric brands by 2025. BMW is looking to sell 100,000 cars and plug-in hybrids in 2017. So this is clearly an important issue, and I guess I would piggyback on the governor when he suggested that people call their Legislators, I would strongly urge you to do the same with your congressional representatives and explain that the CAFE standards are an absolutely critical tool. Fuel switching. So obviously electric, transitioning to electric engines has two benefits. First, electric motors are inherently more efficient than gas motors. 
the gas motors lose 62% of energy and friction and heat. So on average, electric vehicles can travel more than three times farther using the same amount of energy that a compar comparable gas-powered vehicle uses. So using the energy equivalent of one gallon of gasoline, a Nissan LEAF can travel 114 miles. And this explains why even in a grid like Colorado's, where coal is heavy, part of the portfolio, emissions are still significantly less for EVs than for gasoline cars. Second, if an electric car is connected to a really clean grid, then the potential for GHG savings is even more significant. And you can see our grid there in the far corner of that graph. Um, so, oh, and then we also have a big challenge with electric vehicles, which is building out the infrastructure, and the governor referenced that as well. What I've put up here is just a snippet of the electric highway map for uh, the West Coast, and West Coast states are cooperating quite significantly on trying to build out a really powerful EV corridor from uh, Canada, from actually from BC all the way down to California. Hydrogen cars are another very interesting option. These are hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, and a fuel cell car uses an electric engine, so it's just has the same efficiency. It's filled up at a station with hydrogen, which is burned on board like gas, but it emits only water vapor. So because there are no tailpipe emissions, the carbon intensity of a fuel cell vehicle depends entirely on the distribution, the delivery, and the production of the hydrogen. The graph above here shows different carbon emissions for various methods of obtaining hydrogen. And the current steam methane reform system, SMR, uses natural gas, but there are emerging options to use SMR with biogas or with electroly electrolysis that would be very clean. The great thing is we don't really have to choose between hydrogen fuel cell cars or electric cars. They're both very good technologies. And hydrogen may be better, as I mentioned earlier, for trucks and larger SUVs, while the battery electric is very good for smaller cars. Hyundai has a fuel cell version of its Tucson uh, that is available in California. Um, but we do have the same challenges with hydrogen as we do with EVs and building infrastructure. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about autonomous vehicles. So positive scenario for autonomous vehicles. They enable what's called vehicle right sizing, which is due to their increased safety. So this means that the cars can be uh, smaller and lighter and safe in that version, and so that will increase vehicle efficiency. Um, there is something called AV platooning, which is what you see in the picture at the bottom there. And um, this enables, this also increases efficiency, could alleviate congestion, and uh, is potentially an important tool. Right sizing, which is, um, Oh, I discussed that actually up above. And then there's an acceleration of electrification that autonomous vehicles is also bringing about. Under a shared deployment scenario, electric uh, automated vehicles would return to a centralized hub, such as the one that's depicted here, and uh, potentially powered by solar, which would make them all clean. And that would enable cities to remove parking spaces in favor of green spaces and also encourage denser development. According to a Sightline study, Sightline being a think tank here in Washington state, um, parking covers between 10 and 20 percent of land area in our northwest cities. So it is projected also that self-driving cars could cost somewhere between car sharing, which is about 60 cents to a dollar per mile, and human-driven taxis, which are about two to three dollars per mile. So this makes AVs economical if you uh, drive fewer than 5,000 miles a year. A not so rosy scenario for autonomous vehicles is that the increased convenience and all of the car time productivity that people would have would drive an increase in vehicle miles traveled, which would also re and result in a reduced use of transit use. 
and, and therefore funding for transit use, and that could increase congestion, which is, as we all know, the last thing we need, particularly in this state. Um, the other aspect is the populations that can't drive, the elderly or uh, people under 16 can't get their license, could now be in autonomous vehicles, and that could increase vehicle miles traveled. Um, we might see a rise in zero occupancy travel, and after 30 years of trying to shift from single occupant vehicles to high occupant vehicles, it's definitely depressing to hear about zero <laughs> occupant vehicles that might crowd us. Um, and then a potential for an increase in sprawl. So, the benefits of AVs, the platooning, the right sizing, traffic smoothing, all requires a saturation point. And that is not likely to happen overnight. So there's a very delicate balance or that needs to take place between how AVs are introduced to the market, what policies are developed to introduce them thoughtfully, and uh, oh, one other point is that it's much easier to deploy AVs on highways than in urban environments. So, designing the policies to get the most out of this technology is going to be vital to ensure that AVs are not an additional burden on the system. So, in summary, decarbonizing transportation is critically important to solving the climate crisis. There are multiple efficiency and fuel switching options for each of the sectors. And they're all actively in play. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Eileen. So we, we thought um, rather than just having Eileen take questions, we'd invite Joel back here uh, as the head of the Energy Institute and the co-chair of today's conference to answer some questions with Eileen about, you know, what are some of the key areas of innovation uh, that people should be focused on, why we were thinking of putting together the program we did today, um, some of the other key elements like that. So I, I guess I'll just start with Joel. Uh, and I'll, I'll also, let me just say that I'm going to ask a couple questions to get people going but then want people to either go to the microphone or put your hands up. Um, I'm talkative, so I could probably keep going till lunch <laughs> with questions, but I'd rather get questions from all of you. So I'm just starting with a couple. Think of what questions you'd like to ask, since I know you all memorized everything in Eileen's <laughs> talk and have that um, already at the top of your mind. So Joel, what are your thoughts? Well, thanks, Ross, and thanks, Eileen, for joining us and for framing the, the whole discussion so comprehensively. You know, when I talk about uh, decarbonization or, or really just kind of the clean energy transition, I usually think about the, the pillars being uh, a couple different ideas. Massive improvement in energy efficiency, decarbonization of the energy supply, particularly electricity, and potentially increased electrification. And it seems to me that if, if I sort of uh, assimilate the um, material that you presented and kind of the, the Cliff's Notes version, you've, you've kind of hit on those pillars. Is, is that a, a good way to, to sort of uh, frame the recommended strategy? Yes, but I think that the critical point to make here is, is that it is, uh, it is not all just electrification. Electrification is critically important, but I think one of the key points I was trying to make is that for certain industries and certain types of vehicles, you're going to have to have lower carbon um, fuels as well, at least right now, and with what we know about existing technology, and that's what makes the transportation sector such a difficult nut to crack. So I think we should be doing the best we can be to be on a 100% clean grid by 2030, if at all possible, 2035 at the outside, and then electrify everything, not just transport buildings, you know, as much as we possibly can. But I think at least with what we know now, uh, particularly in aviation and marine and freight. Uh, there's very little that, uh, that I see that doesn't say we need to be investing significantly in advanced biofuels and lower, lower uh, carbon fuel sources, too. Is, is there something we should do to get the sound better? Or is, that is there an issue? Just close to the mic? Close okay. or farther? Yeah. Farther. 
So one of the interesting observations, if, if we think about that, that matrix, is as we pursue uh, energy efficiency, for example, in buildings uh, or uh, decarbonization, even um, using a greater share of renewables to generate power, as we make progress, as we succeed and make the grid, grid cleaner, each unit of energy, each kilowatt hour, say, that we save or that we re replace actually gives us less incremental benefit because what we're replacing is, is now cleaner. The flip side, though, is if you think about uh, in transport, um, as the grid gets cleaner, each kilowatt hour that we put into a plug-in vehicle, for example, actually has incrementally more benefit because we're still backing out uh, you know, gasoline or diesel or, or maybe it's, it's a, a blended biofuel. But, but we actually get sort of more bang for the buck as decarbonization happens with electrification, uh, whereas initially it seems like efficiency and, and the decarbonizing of, of, of power has the greatest payoff. Right. Well, we need it all. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to comment on, on biofuels? Um, there's, there are scenarios where biofuels are uh, decarbonizing uh, strategy, but there's also a lot of trade-offs with regard to either mm -hmm. the embedded energy or the land use implications. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, there, is there progress in, in that, that direction of making biofuels ever more renewable? Well, th there are issues with advanced biofuels, and I referenced the food versus fuel issue. Um, there are definitely in the life cycle um, of production and uh, biofuels, there are questions about how low carbon they are, and also in areas, you know, so, there, so there are significant issues. Um, there's also an enormous amount of work that's being done on it. And so I think when you look at decarbonization broadly, you look at the whole uh, carbon budget, and um, you want to try to achieve everything you can from the electrification, as you were describing, that getting that as clean as possible, but within the carbon budget, there should be enough allowed for us to have some biofuels, even if there are issues. But there are a lot of companies that are trying to figure it out, and mm -hmm. over time, I'm confident we will if we invest in the R&D, and if we don't walk away from the industry, um, and if we embrace it uh, as a nation, actually, federally in particular. So one of the areas where biofuels will come up in our conversation this afternoon in our panel discussions is uh, in the, the panel regarding aviation. Um, obviously, airplanes is one of the more difficult uh, mm -hmm. subsectors to electrify. Um, and, and so that's, I think, uh, one of the priorities for thinking about how we'll eventually include um, uh, biofuels as, as a decarbonizing strategy. So the, the, the sessions this afternoon will be organized sort of like that old movie, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. <laughs> we'll have um, a session on aviation energy. We'll have a session on freight energy. We'll have a session on personal mobility. That's the ad automobiles. And then at the end, we'll have a, a session on policy, which might kind of sound like it reflects what I was saying earlier about the, the structure of our program. And it seems to me when, when you were describing kind of the, the strategic priorities, uh, I heard an awful lot of, of need for innovation in, in technology and an awful lot of work for our engineers, but mm -hmm. I also heard a lot about um, there will be a lot of lawyers uh, and there will be a lot of policy initiatives <laughs> yes. and there will be a lot of policy debate um, and the need um, mm -hmm. for, for that leverage. And then I also heard a lot about the private sector and a lot about um, business strategies. So is, is that kind of the, the other three pillars right. of, of, our, of, of our activity? And, and really what I'm thinking of here is potential roles for our graduates right. that we're trying to, to prepare them. Is, is, is that kind of a good right. way to frame that part of the discussion? Well, we need all of them. And, and the policy is absolutely critical. I mean, what, when you look at, you analyze what policies like low carbon fuel standards are doing, in California and in other parts, in British Columbia and other places where they're in place, these are absolutely critical tools. And so the uh, graduating students who understand how these policies work and can figure out how to get our legislators to understand their value is crucially important. So we need actually the policy 
is an incredibly important part and obviously at this particular moment in the history of our country we have an administration that is walking away from the very policies that we should actually be doubling down on. So what that requires now is that our states embrace these policies and um, my hope is, is that in the next three to four years as we um, have uh, the federal government somewhat absent in this space, uh, as they appear to want to be, that we will have really strong activity um, and coordination between cities and states. So policy piece is critical at the local level, as well as at the state level and the federal. Um, and the technologists are absolutely critical. Um, one of the bright spots we have right now is the business sector. I mean, I'm hopeful that part of how we're going to withstand this four-year period is the fact that there's so much momentum in the clean energy economy and that the economics are actually, um, in many cases, pointing in the right direction. So we have to figure out how to uh, continue to encourage those markets and um, build those businesses. Um, R&D is exceptionally important, and uh, obviously our governor understands that. I think we all understand that. It's, um, it's definitely a, been a huge part of how this nation has built um, a lot of different technologies. So it's extremely important for us to continue to advocate for and understand what research and development is needed and where to, where to put the energy and the money in those technologies. So I suspect that students who are in this room and who are graduating this program are going to play a very important role in all of those different areas. So if we think about the, the state's role, we mentioned uh, low carbon fuel standards, which California has, for mm -hmm. example, and the Northwest states have, have been uh, incorporating, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the, in the power sector, most of our uh, electric utility regulation is done at the state level. Our, our, our building energy codes, for example, state, at the state right. level. There's really a lot of leverage. Uh, in terms of, of the policy environment at the state level. One place where, where the, the federal standards are paramount, though, is, is when you mention uh, the CAFE standards. Right. So if I understand it right, the CAFE standards were, were put in place in 1975 and, and ratcheted up fuel efficiency of vehicles, mm -hmm. which in the 70s averaged about 13 miles per gallon. Right. And they were doubled up until 1985, and then they were stagnant for 25 years. And, and only uh, recently, new rounds of CAFE standards began to increase the required fuel economy of new vehicles, and we're about halfway through mm -hmm. that process. And, and the second round, the, the 2016 to 2025 uh, standard, uh, was meant to be reviewed, as you said, mm -hmm. in 2018, and it's really the kind of the last uh, tranche of, of uh, progress from 2022, I think it is, right. to 2025 that's right. being reviewed. Is that, is that accurate, kind of where it stands? Yes. yes. So the other funny thing about CAFE standards is that when we talk about emissions standards and, and fuel economy, uh, it was actually started by, at the state level, mm -hmm. right, in California mm -hmm. way back. And California always had more stringent standards, including putting in a CO2, effectively right. a CAFE standard, uh, legislation back in the early 2000s. And there's still an exemption. Yes. Right? That's correct. Are you, are you familiar well, with California how that works? California may save us in this. That's one of the many pieces of the CAFE puzzle, and there are many. But the fact that California still possesses its waiver to set its own rules under the Clean Air Act um, and any state can choose between the federal standard and the California standard. So that's a key part of it. And currently, 35 to 40 percent of the new car market, uh, depending on the year of the car, is actually led by California, so, um, which subscribes to the California Air Resources Board standards. So um, part of what the Obama administration did was to harmonize all of the different standards, um, and that's very helpful in sending the right market signal for the businesses that are trying to understand how to comply. So it would obviously not be helpful to go back to disharmony, um, but it is, in the California piece of the cafe puzzle is a strong, um, it's, is a strong sign of hope that it's gonna be very difficult for the Trump administration to unravel. 
that piece. So, so one option then for Washington to carry out a clean energy strategy then would be right. to, to back California should that waiver right. become relevant and, and uh, you know, if, if harmony is not reestablished, at least to, uh, to uh, play that, that tune solo. Right. <laughs> right. Interesting. Cool. Russ. I just wanted to, uh, we promised some time for audience questions yeah. and we've got some folks lined up. Want to go ahead? Yes, hello, thank you very much for organizing this. You know, I wonder, uh, a lot depends on perhaps new technology, but we've, in 1915 or 1928, we had 15% uh, of our rail, 600, uh, 760 miles in Washington state was electrified. In 1915, we were doing regenerative braking and powering rail with renewable energy. Uh, you know, the uh, energy efficiency and geeking out on how, many, how much more we can reduce in, um, in shipping or even in rail doesn't really, to me, make as much sense as it does getting things off of the roads onto the most easily electrifiable, decarbonizable part, mass transportation, which is railroads. Um, and in solving a problem that right now 3.8% of value of freight runs on the rails, only 3%, but a huge portion of the weight value runs on freight, and 70% of the value of freight runs on trucks and our roads. Mm -hmm. So isn't it, shouldn't we actually go back to use the technology that we already know, and then what about using those corridors as uh, energy transmission if we don't do that in Washington State, aren't we going to fall behind California that's already tar talking about decarbonizing freight and aren't our ports going to lose uh, mm. business because we only have a 24-hour advantage to getting east? I mean, maybe that's, why aren't we talking more about that? And mm -hmm. we did a book on solutionary rail, that's why it's so oh, right. fresh for me, but I really am I don't understand why we would geek out so much on solving really small problems around uh, ships, except for to get freight and people off of trucks and, um, mm -hmm. and cars and onto trains and ships. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, that's a very interesting point. I, I'm not a, a, that expert in that piece of it, so I wouldn't comment on it, but I think it's true. I'm certainly in all the reading I did, you're absolutely right. That's a huge opportunity. I don't know what the issues are with rail crossing and traffic and most of what I know about the rail challenges we have here has been what I've learned through the coal export and the oil transport. So that's my base for that. Right. And the reinvestment in rail corridor in a public-private partnership I think would be a good solution because if, you're sh if the rail business is dependent upon moving only heavy fossil fuels and not stopping in communities and serving other things, then we're not going to make that transition. Right. And so the, the uh, grade separation, electrification, is right. really not going to happen by the railroads themselves without public-private partnership. Right. Okay. That's totally true. And it would be great to have high-speed rail also in general, frankly, <laughs> for passengers travel. Yes. No, I don't. Except yeah. for the fact that, that this idea of the studying 250 mile an hour rail is actually already been studied and we've already determined that we only need right. 110 miles an hour to serve the right. northeast, west cor north, south yeah. corridor. And you don't need very high-speed rail for that. You can use existing corridor. Right. Well, anything would be an improvement for those of us who go up and down the corridor it. in a car. Yeah. Right, <laughs> so. if we can afford it, but at, at $2.5 million per mile for electrification versus $125 million per mile for new green corridor minimum, it's an easy choice to me. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Go ahead. Hi. Students I first, always. Okay. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Is that loud? Okay, so my name's, Anna. my name's Anna, I'm an energy policy minor student here, and I just was wondering if you could speak briefly on a carbon tax in Washington and what that might mean for like the average Washingtonian and especially uh, lower income folks in Washington state. I'm actually gonna, I see that Vlad just left the room, so I can't punt that to him, so I'm gonna turn that to Ross. Uh, Maybe we'll punt that to David Roberts for our <laughs> lunch speaker. But no, there's, there's a lot of different options. As you know, the Washington State uh, voters did reject a particular kind of carbon tax at the ballot um, last fall, which was for a revenue neutral carbon tax that was being instituted initially at a fairly small amount. Uh, I'd say the particular impacts that you were asking about on lower income consumers and communities is really going to depend a lot on a 
what price is put in place and where the revenues go. Uh, for example, the proposal that's being put forward by a group called the Alliance for Jobs and Clean Energy is proposing for something that would be plowing revenues back specifically into a variety of places, including clean energy transition, um, addressing some of the biggest impacts, including water, uh, forest fire, other areas, but also uh, putting revenues back into the pockets for low-income consumers. There's a whole variety of other proposals. There's a lot of attention nationally being addressed towards um, either a revenue neutral tax or something that would um, actually be what's called a fee and dividend proposal where the money would go back to people directly. The big challenge on all these things, of course, is finding political will to establish a price on carbon uh, and to ensure we're going to be moving that. And I'd say more on that later. Um, Governor Inslee is currently, uh, as he mentioned in his talk, focusing on a proposal in the legislature that would uh, be applying uh, the revenues to the budget shortfall that we have, which primarily with them would be going to education. Uh, and so it's impossible to say what a particular impact of a carbon tax Bradley would be without getting into the specifics. Other questions? I think we've got but, time but for one or two more. But economically, it would be really great for the <laughs> to price the pollution and send the right market signal that it should be way more expensive to pollute. So. Uh, hi there. For, this is for you, Eileen. Um, comment on one of the slides on uh, AVs specifically. So um, talking about saturation points, um, what kind of saturation point would be required before you see major benefits from platooning or the elimination of traffic effects like the for the AV. effect? Yeah, for AV. I believe it was between 40 and 45, 50 percent. I'm looking to Jamie somewhere between, right? Right. I also find it really interesting, um, the comments about uh, in increasing uh, transportation demand from AVs. Um, and a follow-up question on that would be, do you see um, a sort of shared economy approach to AV transportation, one of the potential solutions to driving traffic de um, transportation demand? I could see that maybe reducing the number of vehicles that could be on the road, but it probably wouldn't solve the uh, zero occupancy problem like you <laughs> mentioned. So. Right. Well, and as we know, many of the car sharing uh, companies are looking at and testing the uh, automatic vehicles. So, yeah, there's, it's an incredibly interesting and dynamic um, field right now, and it's a bit unclear how it's going to, wh which is going to win from a carbon and a climate point of view, which is the lens I use. Um, but I also think there's uh, interesting questions around workers and <laughs> livelihoods for people, too which wasn't the part, part of this talk, but it's really fascinating to watch and see how it's unfolding and very unclear sort of who's going to win and how, where policy is going to get made and come in and try and shape it. I gather as much it seems like a very dynamic area, so yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank Time you very much. Time for one more much. question. Student. Thanks so much for speaking. Um, I'm here from the Planet Magazine. We're doing actually a short documentary on tanker traffic in the Salish Sea and the in energy implications about it and whatnot. And uh, I was curious, you talked a lot about autonomous vehicles, AVs, and the saturation point and increased amounts of vehicles on the roads and more people driving that, or I guess they're not technically driving, but more people in cars that wouldn't necessarily be. And I'm wondering if you see a similar result or might predict a similar result from automated shipping. It's, well, and then how that would fit into concerns about vessel traffic, et cetera, um, mm -hmm. in the Salish Sea and the San Juans in particular. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely such a huge area of growth. And uh, so I think there are, are those potentials as well. Jamie, do you want to say anything about that? or?
I'll recommend that you interview uh, Commissioner Fred Fellman, who's going to be talking <laughs> on the aviation panel. He's one of the, the nation's leading experts on the sailor sea and what needs to be done to protect it from you know, potential spills of tankers and other kinds of impacts. Right so, there. Fred, I hope that's okay. Thank you. You can raise your hand. <laughs> so I want to thank uh, Eileen for a fabulous presentation. Uh, as she mentioned, all those slides, including her copious notes that she and Jamie put together, are online and are going to be available for everybody. Thanking Joel for participating here on the panel and for his leadership in the Institute. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, welcome you all to grab lunch. We're going to be coming back here in 30 minutes to have our lunch keynote presentation from David Roberts. Thank you. Thanks, Ross.